Nick Majerison here. Welcome to Top Med Talk and welcome to the Top Med Talk Top 10. Firstly, before we get into the top 10, I just want to tell you, our editor-in-chief, Monty Mython, is now at Dingle 2018. 20th current controversies in anaesthesia and perioperative medicine. We'll be bringing you updates from the conference over the next week or so. We've already heard it's been hugely significant in terms of the information available and the people who have attended. So stay with us for more details. Also, we're going to be covering the American Society of Anesthesiologists, the ASA, meeting in San Francisco on the 13th to the 17th of October. So make sure you go to our website where you'll see when and where we're going to be live streaming Oh, and it's worth mentioning as well that you can contribute questions via slido.com. Now, the event code that you need to put into the little box there is hashtag TMTASA18. So if you go to the Slido website, that's slido.com, and then pop your little event code, the sort of the login thing, it says hashtag TMTASA18, which is easy to remember, isn't it? Top Med Talk ASA. 2018 so hashtag tmt asa 18 if you put that into your event code you then get access to the slido questions area where you can submit a question which will be tackled on stage during the presentations at the asa 2018 so slido.com i'll tell you more about that at the end of the podcast including how you can sign up for our email updates so you can always be part of our conference coverage Anyway, here's our top 10 entry for today. And it's EBPOM 2018. Sir Bruce Keogh, the NHS at 70. This was an absolute monster of a podcast for us. Uh, The NHS, of course, a national institution beloved by the people of the UK, 70 years old. And here we get the chance to hear Sir Bruce Keogh, a giant in the world of UK healthcare, British surgeon and physician who specialises in cardiac surgery. He was, until this year, Medical Director of the National Health Service and the National Medical Director of the NHS Commissioning Board. Have a listen to what he has to say about the NHS at 70. Top Bird Talk. It's coming to our last speaker of the day and I'm delighted to welcome um, Sir Bruce Keogh to the stage. Um, Bruce, as many of you will know, is our recently retired uh, medical director of the National Health Service. Um, started his life as a cardiac surgeon. Um, talked to us on the stage about 12, 13 years ago, so which you remember very fondly. Um, most of you will know the NHS is 70 years old this week. Um, and it's, it's quite a special moment. There's lots of changes in funding coming, lots of changes um, about the way that we do things. And I'm really grateful for Bruce for giving us the Ernest Henry Starling Plenary Lecture of 2018, which will be RNHS 70 years on. Bruce, welcome. Thank you. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. And can I just say thanks so much for the invitation to come and say a few words. I think it was 2008 uh, that I was here last. Somebody reminded me that I was then talking about the 60th anniversary of the NHS. Um, While I was waiting to come in, I was watching Prime Minister's Question Time on my mobile phone. It's a sort of sad thing you do when you've been in the job that I've been in for a while. And um, I was reminded of Dickens' remarks, where he said it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, the epoch of incredulity, the season of light, the season of darkness, and the spring of hope and the winter of despair. And I think we're living in a very febrile kind of political environment at the moment. And I'm equally reminded of something that Bevan said uh, round about um, the time that he was arguing for National Health Service. He said, discontent arises from a knowledge of the possible as contrasted with the actual. And when you think about that, that's really quite a profound statement. I've also found myself reflecting on Uh, the personal observation that I think the tectonic plates of politics, leadership, power, and public expectations are shifting, not just in this country, but around the world. We're seeing increasing um, dissatisfaction with the institutions of government, the institutions that are meant to be looking after people, whether they happen to be in Europe or whether they happen to be in Washington. This is fueled by the economic consequences of the 2008 global financial crisis, coupled 
with the technological power of instant communication. And so it's breeding a sense of localism and a sense of commentary and a sense of uh, different expectations. We've seen it with the election of Donald Trump in um, North America. We've seen it with the Brexit um, referendum in this country. And we've seen it to some extent where, with the um, junior doctors signaling discontent about not just the way they were being treated in the NHS, but equally, I think, concern about the future of the National Health Service. And Darwin is attributed, as having said, and I, I don't think it was him, but he gets the credit anyway. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but it's the most adaptive. And I find myself thinking there are many healthcare systems around the world. None of them are perfect. We do not have a perfect healthcare system. We never will because of the nature of the progression of science and healthcare. And all are struggling with pretty serious climate change. They're having to deal with the winds of changing demand. So the demand for our NHS going up about 4% per year. Escalating, rapidly escalating cost of drugs. Our annual drugs bill is about 16 billion pounds. It's going up at, 17, at 7% per year. So that's 7% of a big number. And changing public, professional and political expectations. And it's also having to deal with the darkness, all of them, of financial constraint, whatever form that might take. But the United States don't have enough money to run their healthcare system. You see that being debated in the Senate. Germany don't have enough money. France doesn't have enough money. We don't feel we have enough money. And people in Zimbabwe don't feel they have enough money. So the solution um, lies somewhere in the intellectual capital of people working in um, healthcare systems. But we've been here before, so given that this is sort of the last talk of the day and nobody really wants to hear too much data, um, let me just ask you to imagine it was 1947 and we were thinking of establishing a health service. The first three months of the year saw a terrible winter with a shortage of fuel, so people were getting cold. April saw the worst floods in the country for 53 years. In May, the exchange rate with a dollar changed so that the price of foodstuffs went up. It had also gone up as a consequence of the floods and the, and the prolonged winter. And bread was rationed for the first time, having never been rationed before. In September, the meat ration was reduced from what it had been during the war. The bacon ration was halved in October. And in November, potatoes were rationed. Not a great time to have a big debate about spending a load of money on a health service, you might argue. But actually, it leads you to the hypothesis that um, great things can come out of hard times. And I was traveling on the tube recently, and I bumped into an old, well, he's not old, actually, but a, a consultant colleague from St. Thomas's. It was about 11 o'clock in the evening, so I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions as to what kind of nick he was in. But he, he was sitting on the other side of the tube and he leant over and said, Bruce, he said, how bad do things have to get before we actually change? And there's some merit in that, um, in that particular question. So I'm going to invite you just to sit back and think, do we have a track record of being able to do stuff in this country? Can we change? I'd like you to think about our contribution to global medicine in terms of science. Imagine you lived in a country that had postulated the theory of evolution, that had unraveled the double helix, that held the intellectual property for most of the nucleic acid chemistry, that had developed the chemistry behind the um, contraceptive pill, that had discovered antibiotics, that had done the first stem cell transplant, the first blood transplant, that had developed the ability to stop and start the heart electively, which was the basis of my previous specialty. Um, or in technology that had invented the clinical thermometer, the intraocular lens, the artificial hip, the laryngeal mask, the ECG, um, the MRI scanner or the CT scanner. You might think, well, 
that country's made a reasonable contribution to, uh, to global medicine. Imagine if that country also had four of the top ten universities in the world. Although, to be fair, some are drifting down. Um, but it's good for the purposes of the talk. Um, imagine also um, if that country had twice as many Nobel Prize winners for medicine or physiology per capita of population than any other major Western country. Imagine also if, in terms of publications, it had 1% of the world's population, funded 3% of the world's research, produced 6% of the world's medical research papers, and 16% of the highest um, ranked papers, highest cited papers. You would think that's not a bad country to, uh, to pursue a medical career in. Imagine also if you thought that country ranked number two or three on the Global Innovation Index put together by INSEAD and the World Intellectual Property Organization. You'd think that's okay. And then if you thought, well, that country also has 5,000 life science companies employing 235,000 people with a 64 billion pound turnover and a pharma industry and medtech industry responsible for 10% of all the country's exports. You might think that's not bad, given that financial services are our biggest export. You think that's not bad. But if you could link all of that to the biggest semi-integrated healthcare system in the world, you could start to conjure up a hypothesis that we could, with a following wind, have the best healthcare system in the world. And I still believe that's possible. I think it's a stone's throw away. There'll be hours of debate about the size of the stone, the type of the stone, the geology of the stone, how big it is, where it is, who's going to throw it and how far. But the point is there is a stone. And, um, and I think we're in just as good a position. I'll come right back to this at the end as, as any other healthcare system to tackle some of the problems. We have uh, quite a significant substrate. Um, we have 440 million Pharmacy visits a year, 360 million GP visits, 100 million visits to outpatient departments, 100 million visits to community services. We have 24 million telephone consultations. We have about 9 million ambulance journeys. We have um, 16 million admissions to hospital and about 24 million uh, attendances at A&E a year. So there's a lot of activity going on. And on top of that, we have one billion prescriptions a year. There is more activity through the NHS spine in terms of transactions by a factor of several fold. I've heard two figures. I've heard two and four, so I'm not quite sure which one's true. But in either event, it's big. Two or four fold as many transactions as go through all the debit and credit cards in the country in a day. And that gives you some idea of the magnitude of the operation um, that, uh, that we're involved in. Now, change is complex. And one of the reasons it's complex is because we have, frankly, such a fragmented uh, NHS. We have um, a lot of different organizations. There are advantages and disadvantages to that. We have 137 acute trusts, 17 specialist trusts, 56 mental health trusts, 35 community trusts, 10 ambulance services, 780, uh, 7,800 and falling GP practices, and 853 private providers um, of services on over 7,000 sites. So trying to get coherence of change in that number of organizations, all of which have their own leadership and their own views, is quite tricky. Now, I was appointed medical director of the health service in 2007, and in March 2008, the global financial crisis struck, at which point there was a decision to take in to take uh, 40% of management costs out of the NHS, which happened over the course of the following year. And that, of course, was the year of the 60th anniversary of the NHS when Ara Darcy, um, a colorectal surgeon, was uh, a minister of health in the Lords, and he led... Um, uh, what was known as either the Darcy Review or High Quality Care for All across the NHS. And he came to three conclusions. Um, one was we'd kind of dropped the ball on quality over the years. The second was that clinical leadership was kind of sitting over here 
and the rest of the NHS was over there. And um, finally, that we weren't focusing enough on personalization. And then personalization got into the kind of political lexicon and just meant different things to everybody. But in my view, it covers a spectrum from just being decent to people when they show up in your clinic, offering the same kind of courtesies you might offer someone coming into your own home, right through to the hardcore uh, pharmacogenetics. And a quality framework was set out. I won't go into the details of that now. Um, Actually, I might. And the reason that I'm going to go into it is because it does have some links, actually, with Duke, funnily enough. Um, It's strange working in the Department of Health uh, as a bureaucrat because there's a bunch of rules that you can't even begin to understand, not least of all you're not allowed to write your own letters, you're not allowed to put entries in your diary, you're not allowed to open your own post. But I bumped into Aradazi in a corridor once that I want you to um, to develop a quality out a quality framework for the NHS, and um, I thought, wow, I wasn't sure whether he was joking or not. So I went back up to my office and I was just thinking about it. And the post came, and in it there was a parcel. This was about forty minutes after we had had the conversation, and in the parcel was something from someone called Sheila Leatherman. Um, who's a health policy person who works at Duke. And she had done a, an assessment to the NHS. And I, just, I said to the people in the office, do you mind if I open this? And there was a debate, and then they said yes. <laughs> so I opened it. And um, they, um, I paged through it, and suddenly came to a thing saying, quality framework. So now I thought, what do I do? I thought, how long before I go back to Aaron and say, I've done it? I thought... <laughs> Maybe another 10 or 15 minutes would be fine. So I went back down. We rang uh, Sheila and said, can we plagiarize? And the answer was yes. But she sort of thought that there were seven things that would lead to improvement in quality. The first was to define quality. We didn't have a clear definition of what that meant. The second was we should measure it. The third was that we should reward people for quality rather than just penalizing people, which is our general kind of financial strategy. The fourth was we should put leadership in place to enable Um, those things to happen. The um, fifth was that we should develop academic endeavor, um, and that led to the concept of the academic health science um, centers and subsequently to networks. Um, And the sixth was that we should kind of regulate to have our gains, and I've forgotten what the seventh was, but you get the idea. It was a fairly structured thing. And we were making progress with that when, in 2010, there was another election. And just as that was beginning to bite, we had a coalition government um, with Andrew Lanzi coming in as a new Secretary of State with his own views as to the way things should be done. We managed to get him to hang on to a definition of quality, which, as most people know, was in the domains of effectiveness, safety, and patient experience. Um, But he summoned me and he said... I want you to make um, clinical outcomes a currency of the NHS. And that had been an interest of mine for some time. And that seemed a great challenge. And I got some guys in my team to think about it. And we had a smart guy who didn't have a health background, actually. He'd come from the cabinet office. He rang me about 48 hours later. He said, Bruce, he said, I think I've got it. He said, doesn't matter what healthcare system you're thinking of, it should do five things. He said, firstly it should stop you dying prematurely from things that it can. Now, that's only a small proportion of illnesses. There's some major determinants of early mortality or education, tobacco usage, that kind of stuff. Um, but he was referring to cardiovascular disease and things like that. The second thing is it should help you live well with a long-term condition. The third thing is it should help you get better from... Um, a recoverable illness, broken leg, cataract operation, something like that. All of that fitted neatly into the domain of clinical effectiveness. He said that it should also um, treat you decently, and that was about patient experience, and finally it should treat you safely. And I'm quite clear in my own mind what safety means. Safety is about um, accepting the concept, the notion that people recognize that their disease has a risk, recognizing that Treatment may or may not carry some degree of risk. The patient makes a value judgment on that. What they should never have to take into account in that equation is the way we design, deliver, um, or execute our services. 
they should never have to bear in mind that that could adversely affect the risk. And um, we set about on that, trying to develop simply some very 50 high-level measures for the NHS to give us a feel for whether things are moving in, in the right direction. And um, we can talk about that if we have to, but broadly speaking, they are. But in the meantime, we tackled a number of problems. Now, I've been a little bit disappointed with some of the media coverage on the NHS over the last few weeks, where much of the focus, there's been some celebratory stuff, but some of the focus has been um, uh, quite critical in a way, and I accept the need um, for that kind of diagnostic criticism, because if you don't make the diagnosis, you can't treat the problem. But we have made some big gains, and it hasn't always, sadly, come from people working in the NHS. MRSA was an example. So in 2003-04, um, when uh, I was a surgeon working in Birmingham and kind of prowling the ITU, we had 7,700 cases of blood-borne MRSA in the NHS a year. And I remember my secretary said to me once, she said, you've seen the stuff from the Department of Health. They want to halve MRSA rates. And I thought to myself, you know, what are those guys smoking? You know, we just come down to our ITU. You know, you've got old patients, sick patients, transplant patients with, you know, on immunosuppressants and so on and so forth. What do they expect? Now, the thing that had driven that was the Daily Mail. Um, the Daily Mail had been having a go about MRSA um, on a daily basis. And eventually, John Reed, who was the Secretary of State, a guy with a history degree, he just got fed up with it. And he summoned the chief nursing officer and just said, I want MRSA half halved in three years. And then, you know, he made a political announcement. And the question was, no, nobody really knew what to do. But in the event, a plan was put in place. And by 2015 and 16, there were only 817 cases. That's an over 90% reduction. And what's always niggled at me is that the ambition to do that came from outside the clinical professions. It didn't come from inside. And yet we knew from the days of Semmelweis exactly what we should do because the strategy wasn't hugely different. Anyway, I leave that as a reflection. I think the next learning point I had was um, I used to be summoned um, to various select committees in Parliament from time to time. Anyway, I got summoned to talk to a parliamentary committee on venous thromboembolism. And there was a group of people, it was a room about this size, and there were probably 150 people in there. A lot of them were researchers, and they were campaigners to do stuff for venous thromboembolism. I was a bit sceptical, because I knew they were funded by anticoagulant people. Anyway, the evidence was presented that loads of people were dying in our NHS, some figure over 50,000 from... Um, no, it was 38,000 people were dying in our hospitals from VTE, and 25,000 of those were preventable. Seemed a big number to me. But nevertheless, uh, there was no argument among the researchers about the numbers. And then they turned on me and, sa and said, you need to mandate venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. The first person to say that was the president of the Royal College of Surgeons, John Black. He said, I did my thesis on this 40 years ago, and nothing's changed. And then the president of the Royal College of Physicians stood up and said exactly the same. He said, nothing's changed. You've got to mandate it. And what I was trying to do was, was not mandate stuff. So I said, look, it's not my job to tell you guys what to do. And, um, you know, I talked about clinical freedom and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, as I was walking back to my office, a penny dropped. They weren't asking me to tell them what to do. They were saying, make it easy for us to do what we know needs to be done. And so I got hold of the 10 regional medical directors and um, all the college presidents. And we said, what should we do? Shall we tackle VTE? And the answer was Yes. And what I learned from that was that where you had a common clinical consensus that something could be tackled, I could then easily go to the NHS management board or whatever forum was the appropriate place and put the financial and other levers in place to make stuff happen. And whilst there was debate about the value of venous thromboembolism assessment with people coming into hospital, it was broadly agreed it was a good thing. And we went from, we couldn't measure it at first, but somewhere between we thought 25 and 40% of people being assessed 
to well over 90% within 18 months, which is one of the fastest changes the NHS has ever seen. And the thing that made that possible was the fact that we had all the colleges saying this is the message, a unity of purpose from the clinical professions. And by colleges, I'm including the Royal College of Nursing and the Royal Pharmaceutical Society and others. And so the lesson there was when you have common purpose between managers, policymakers, and clinicians, you can make good things happen quite quickly. The... The next thing we came into trouble with was trauma centres. So the Public Accounts Committee got upset. They said in America they've got big trauma centres, much better than here. And um, we were in the process of trying to develop trauma networks. And Keith Willett, who um, was the National Clinical Director for Trauma, set about setting up a series of trauma networks and designating major trauma centres. And we ended up with 27 major trauma centres and 22 networks. And then it started to get ugly because, again, the Daily Mail started to say this is just a cost-cutting exercise. You guys are killing people. They're going to die in the back of the ambulance. They have to go past a regular A&E. This is not good. And um, all sorts of things happened. But in the first year of operation of those networks, the odds ratio for survival with people with an injury severity score of greater than 8 went up by 15%. In the second year, it went up by 30%, and in the third year, it went up by 50%, and the variability um, reduced quite substantially. So sometimes these things that are right to do don't necessarily get the kind of reception that that you hope. Similarly, with hip fractures, some guys from UCL uh, wrote to me in the early days saying that they wanted to set up a database for, for hip fractures, Um, I thought, well, you know, good luck with that, because I tried setting up one for cardiac surgery, which took 10 years. But they were much better than me. They did it quite quickly. And then um, they used it for for measuring a whole bunch of things. So we put a a payment system in place for hip fractures, which kept 19% of the tariff reserved for 10 things that had to be done, like... You had to have your operation in 36 hours. You had to have proper joint care. You had to have a falls assessment, a bones assessment, and so on and so forth. In 2010-14, only 24% of people having their hips fixed um, had all 10 criteria. And by by the end of 2014, it was up to 64%. And now over 90% have 9 out of the 10 um, things done. And the length of stay went down. Uh, by six days for, um, uh, for hip fractures. And not dissimilar sort of endeavor to the kind of things that you guys are discussing here at the moment. So big things can happen when the right systems are put in place to enable people to do what they want. Similarly with um, myocardial infarction, 99% of people who are eligible now according to... Um, the BESIS database, get uh, primary PCI. 77% get it within 150 minutes of picking up the telephone. That's very impressive. And the mean door, median door to balloon time is 41 minutes. I've seen people advertising, in, you know, when you're traveling on a plane, um, door to balloon times as being really good that are slower than that but this is for the whole country, whether you're in Northumbria or in London. And our secondary prevention um, has gone up spectacularly. This is as a consequence of a framework to to improve things. 98% of all people have a heart attack, end up on antiplatelets, 97 on statins, 96 on beta blockers, and 94 on ACE inhibitors. That's something we should be really proud of in the NHS. Sepsis was the next big kind of clinical thing which we've started to tackle. We've still got some way to go. We started that in kind of 2014. By 2015, we were introducing a bigger focus on sepsis in, um, in A&Es. And at that time, uh, at the beginning, only um, 52% of people who had signs of sepsis were actually being checked for it. And... Um, that rose to 78 in the space of a couple of years, and people getting antibiotics within an hour rose quite quickly. Um, December last year, screening of people, not just in A&E, but across 
uh, the NHS, the sample size is not uniform. And uh, so you have to take this the way it's meant. But in places that have tried to tackle it properly, screening is up at 87% and 80% of people are treated within an hour. Um, and I have to say in the hospital that, that I chair, every single patient that doesn't get it, their antibiotics within an hour, that's assessed. So it's taken quite seriously. Um, the other thing that we are introducing, and you'll probably hear more about this next week, is a national early warning system. Um, ten years ago, the Royal College of Physicians proposed it. Uh, Brian Williams, professor of medicine at UCL, has been working on it for a long time. I think we've got something now that's pretty hard and evidence-based and is good. Um, we're expecting that to go national and be mandatory um, during the course of this year. I was quite horrified to realize that in one area of the country, a high score meant you were doing well, and, a, and in a, an adjacent hospital, a high score meant you were really sick. I mean, if you're moving from hospital to hospital, how, how are you expected to deal with that without mistakes? In terms of stroke, we've had um, an interesting uh, experience, a similar kind of accusations of cost-saving and putting lives at risk. But in London, many of you will know that... Uh, not long ago, there were 32 receiving centres for stroke. We reduced those to eight. And the call, the call to getting to a hyperacute stroke unit time in London is about 55 minutes now. 15% of people are thrombolised. The accusations of people dying in the ambulance have subsided because we've seen an increase in survival, an increase in uh, return to independent living, a reduction in length of stay, and 40% of people going home within, within three days. So that's been another quite uh, significant advantage. The other thing which has caused um, some difficulty was this, this again, frankly, was politically driven. It was driven out of number 10. They wanted us to estimate how many people in each part of the country, uh, they wanted to know the prevalence of dementia because they could see it coming as a big problem. And... There were a number of studies that were done, and um, kind of prevalence indicators were drawn up for each CCG, and then a target was set that, according to that prevalence, um, two thirds of people they should diagnose at least two thirds of people that were expected at having dementia, and this led into direct conflict with a number of of people, because the argument was, why would you want to diagnose dementia when you can't treat it? And that's not an unfair question. The response to that is that it's not about treating people. It's about putting structured support in for their families and, um, and friends and for the individual. And so I think that's pretty well embedded, but I've seen dementia in my own family and I've seen a complete change. Um, I'm not talking about me, just... Uh, I've seen a complete change um, in the way things are treated now. And that, again, was something I was pretty sceptical uh, about at the time. So there are a series of priorities that NHS England is having to deal with at the moment. Cancer, mental health. I had wanted to develop a, a, an arithmetic way of developing priorities. That turned out not to be possible. Um, politics drives a lot of this stuff. Conservatives in the coalition wanted cancer. Lib Dems wanted mental health. Deals were done. Um, but that's the way things sometimes work. But everything that we have to tackle um, requires, I think, very good and robust clinical leadership. And I think we're now in a position where we have more clinical leaders in the NHS than we've ever had before. Um, we have medical directors of NHS... England, NHS Improvement. We have 15 academic health science network, all of which have a very strong clinical um, leadership. We have clinical senates. We have 12 of those. We have regional medical directors now, directors of nursing and pharmacists. We have 16 area medical directors. We have 16 national clinical directors. We have 200 clinical leads of CCGs. We have a whole swathe of physicians working in the GERFT program, which I believe you've heard about, and we have a national quality board. So we're in quite a good position, I think, to tackle, uh, to tackle the future. 
We have Brexit going on in the background. I'm not going to say much about that other than at one level it's a diversion and at another level it's actually a bit of a problem because it does impact on workforce, it impacts on research and it, impacts, it will impact on the cost of, of drugs for this country. That will be an economic consequence. And so as the NHS goes into the next decade, we have some specific issues. We have more older people than younger people. That means there are fewer tax receipts and increased demands out of the exchequer. And you've seen the debate that's gone on in the media over the last few days about that. We have a different set of expectations from the kind of baby booners to Generation X, Y, and Z who communicate more. And we have this paradox where we have an older generation that we have to provide care close to home, continuity of care, eyeball to eyeball contact, and a younger generation who want immediacy of information. And we will slowly see the transformation of medicine into a kind of knowledge transfer business through different uh, methodologies. So I find myself in the light of all of this asking, uh, what would Bevan do now? Dangerous thing to ask, really. But I think he would come back and he would see that the life expectancy of a man has increased from about 65 years to about 80 years. That meant that at the inception of the NHS, half of the men were dead by the time they reached retiring age. Interestingly, it's the same in Russia now that they've just raised the retirement age. So you didn't have the same cost burden that you have now, particularly dealing with with, uh, older people. He would also see that there should be a big focus on prevention of disease and that that Prevention rests with local authorities, metropolitan authorities who deal with housing, education, sport, transport, immunization. And he would see that we have 30% of people in our hospitals don't need to be there, but they're not getting the support out of hospitals to make it easy for people running the hospitals to discharge them with any degree of of reassurance. And... He would look at that and he would say, oh, well, that's social services and that's run largely by the local authorities again. But what he would see would be we've created a construct where we have the NHS over here. We have the local authorities responsible for prevention of disease and keeping people out of hospital. And right in the middle, we have a philosophical, a bureaucratic, a financial fracture in what with care that's free at the point of delivery here, and care which is largely means-tested over in the local authority areas. And I think he would see that that is affecting the lives of people who live on a normal spectrum. You know, most people live somewhere on a spectrum of being intensely ill, requiring intensive care, to being perfectly okay. Some people in the middle requiring increasing degrees of support related to age and comorbidities, ranging from help from your family to tablets. And that right in the middle of that, we've got this fracture. So I think he would be heading down the direction of a health and social care system. And I think there's a dawning realization that the margins between health and care are becoming increasingly blurred, particularly as the population gets older. But we have a problem because the NHS is run from above because the Secretary of State for Health is the executive responsible for the health service, whereas local authorities are answerable to, um, to their local electorates. And we have 27 county councils, 201 district councils, 32 London boroughs. Um, we have... 18,100 councillors. And they have a different view on things to um, the NHS view in a different way of, uh, of doing things. So I think all of that's going to play out. There will be a number of conflicts that have to be resolved. And my guess is it will probably require some form of legislation. Um, the future, in my view, is going to be determined by economics. I've already alluded to the fact no one has money. It's the number one driver of all healthcare systems in the world. The second is that people want more comprehensive and more integrated care. 
And the things which are going to impact on us, I think, that we need to respond to, this is about the Darwinian adaption, is to mobile technology, artificial intelligence. That's starting to come together. When you have Jeff Bezos saying he's linking up with Warren Buffett, and, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, and they're linking up with J.P. Morgan to bring the same kind of disruption to healthcare, we need to sit up and take notice because that's here now. And then finally, genomics and cell and gene therapy. So those, I think, are the big issues for us. And finally, Mark, if you'll uh, forgive me, can I just say, at a time that people are going to be asking, is our NHS fit for the future? I would say with the advent of genomics, where you can start to predict at a population level who's likely to suffer from what disease, and at an individual level, We work in a healthcare system where the values that drive it say we pool our resources, whatever those are, whatever Parliament gives us, we pool our resources and we offer the best care we can to every member of the population, irrespective of their ability to pay, their need, you know, whatever their backgrounds, whatever. There's something really fair in that. And so I find myself wondering whether now is the time. We should be thinking that with the predictive ability of genomics, we aren't better equipped for the future than many other healthcare systems. And I invite you to ask whether you want to be in an insurance-based system with that kind of medicine on the horizon. Thank you. Top you can see why that was so successful in terms of downloads, can't you? It's a great podcast. Now... I said to you before, our editor-in-chief, Monty Mython, is now at Dingle 2018. 20th current controversies in anaesthesia and perioperative medicine. We're going to be bringing you updates from that conference over the next week or so. We've already heard it's been hugely significant. We've got lots of information coming your way soon. Stay locked to this podcast feed. Make sure you've subscribed to Top Meg Talk, incidentally, if you're new to podcasts. If you subscribe, then you catch all of the podcast episodes that we do. Also, find us on social media and uh, sign up to the Twitter, the LinkedIn, the Facebook. We've even got a YouTube channel, all right? So get involved in all of that and stand by for the American Society of Anesthesiologists, the ASA meeting in San Francisco on the 13th to the 17th of October 2018. Make sure you go to our website so you can find out when and where we're going to be streaming from that conference. And when you're on the website, do us a favour, make sure you sign up for our email updates because then we can tell you what we're doing when we're doing it. So topmedtalk.com, that's topmedtalk.com.